hard topic on worship. I started with something and just, I don't know, sometimes you just don't feel it. I thought I was in a ball game and it's just, there's no use to plug ahead if you don't feel something, right? Just to get it done. So I, I just really want to look at this week, I want to look at crucifixion. I know that we, uh, before last fellowship meeting, we had the brethren speak on this, but I, I just want us to look tonight at what Christ said on the cross, and then I want us to look at the crucifixion. Just, and there's no right or wrong, don't feel like you need to open your Bible and find the answer, because I don't want you to. I just want us to talk collectively as a body of believers. I don't have anything to, someone says a wrong thing. God knows I say wrong things all the time. It's just, we're just human. Um, but let's see if we can just, off the top of our head, what are the sayings of Christ upon the cross? There were seven of them. So what were they? What's that? Very good. You going to keep going in order? Because that was the first one. <laughs> <laughs> That's all right. Me too. So he said to actually to John, he said to her, Woman, behold thy son. And he said to her, And behold thy mother. So that's correct. What else did he say on the cross? I thirst. I thirst. His final, or his next to final words were, it is finished. That's right. That's right, Brother Eli. Verily, verily, I say unto you, this day I shall be with thee in paradise. <laughs> Sister Tina, you got that one. Um, you know, ooh, say, ooh, I love this one. Eli, Eli, Shabbatani. Eli, Eli, Bama, Shabbatani. My God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? The Bible school student, you know that? I get those, right? <laughs> that was good. And there's one more. One more. What do we have, brother? So we have, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. Verily, verily, I say unto thee, this day thou shalt be with thee in paradise. Woman, behold thy son. And he said to John, behold thy mother. That was number three. The fourth is, my God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? Number five is, I thirst. The sixth one we said was, it is finished. I literally gave them to you in order. And the one that we don't have is the very last one. It's not, it is finished. That's the next to last one. He did not die. But the Spirit of God spoke to him. And then he said this. Oh, into thy hands I command my spirit. Into my hands, I, into thy hands I commend my spirit. So I want to look at these for a few moments tonight. I want to hear what you have to say about this too. I'm going to share, and uh, I'm going to do them in order. So we're going to be looking at Luke. We're going to be looking at John. We're going to be looking at Matthew. The only uh, gospel right we won't be looking at is Mark. Uh, uh, and so we're going to be looking at these that, that give us. This uh, crucifixion story. You know, we should have church every night during this whole week. Because, you know, when you're at Palm Sunday, you're preaching Palm Sunday. And when you come to Easter, you're preaching the resurrection. And so I feel like I get, I'm missing the crucifixion. And I'm, uh, I'm missing those, those unjust trials by night. Uh, and so there's so much uh, that, that is given. And you're, you're trying to pick what, what you're going to speak. And so uh, I want to focus really upon the crucifixion because I, we'll talk about that on Sunday, but we'll focus on the resurrection on Sunday as well. So I want to look at the crucifixion as we draw our hearts and our minds to, to that as we think about this week. 
So Luke chapter number 23, Luke chapter number 23 is the first one. And verse number 34. Now I'm going to let someone read that. All right, so I'm hopefully, Brother Ron, going to answer some questions for you. You talked about if God was a forgiving God, why didn't he forgive Adam and even the garden? Well, it, it isn't that simple because um, God's requirement um, was great. It was, uh, you, they, they said, it wasn't that they disobeyed God in general, but you got to understand, the world did not know sin. It changed the very course of the world. Now, because of sin, there's a curse. Never before were there thorns on plants. Never before did man work by the sweat of his brow. Never, never before did a woman have a, 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 a pain with childbirth, uh, the labor that she has. Uh, never before was there feelings of jealousy and anger and resentment. And never before was there rebellion. But we would be born into the sin nature because Adam and Eve fell into sin. So it's not just a simple God forgives them and, and because God did forgive them and they were forgiven by this. Before Jesus Christ came as the Son of God, they went and they hid themselves. And what did they cover themselves with? They believed. So, so they knew that they were naked and they knew that they needed a covering because they realized their nakedness. The book of Psalms tells us that up to that point they were covered with the Shekinah glory of God. Of God. Uh, they, they were not robed in clothing, but they weren't ashamed because they had the Spirit of God rub them. Brother Eli, there was nothing to be ashamed of. There was no sin. And so they knew they needed to be covered and God... He, he said, Adam, Adam, where art thou? He knew where he was all along, but he wanted Adam to respond. And so Adam responds, and they're not no longer covered with fig leaves, but now they're covered with the skins of animals because blood had to be shed. God's justice could only be satisfied through the shedding of blood. Throughout the Old Testament, there's always shedding of blood for remission of sins. But it was not a spotless and a perfect sacrifice. The only perfect sacrifice would be the Lamb of God, God sending His own Son. And He sent His own Son, Jesus Christ, to be the propitiation for our sins. Does that help answer some questions? It's all right. Sometimes we have to get it all stacked in order in our mind. So in other words, He punished them and then they were forgiven. Are you saying it like if you do a crime here and you go to jail and you serve your time, then, then you're punished and you're forgiven? Well, God's is law that, is that something like that? Or, or? God's law is set up as justice. But the only thing that can satisfy the justice of God is not a jail cell. It's not a, 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 a punishment from the law. The only thing that can satisfy it is the blood of Jesus Christ. Even for those in the Old Testament, I don't want to get ahead of myself. They went to paradise, they didn't go to heaven because they didn't have the blood of Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ did the work on the cross that changed all things for all eternity. And so, I'll get there in a moment. But speaking of forgiveness, here's Jesus, and he cries to his Father. He says, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. And so here it is, he, he, he seeks forgiveness for all of these individuals. They're mistreating him, but forgiveness wasn't just for their mistreating him. Forgiveness was for their souls. Now, I need to tell you something here tonight. Now, I don't want to upset anyone's apple cart, but I want to tell you that we need to pray for our lost loved ones. Because the Word of God tells us that the effectual fervent prayer of a righteous man avails much. But our prayers will never save someone's soul because even Jesus prayed for those people that they would be forgiven and they would be saved. However, they had to pray the prayer of salvation and believe and trust in Jesus Christ as the Savior for themselves. So every one of us in here, 
No one praying for us will get us to heaven. Even praying for someone else will not get them to heaven. Jesus prayed, Father, forgive them. He, he was praying for their forgiveness, for their salvation. He was also forgiving those who mistreated him and was unjust to him. What did he say on the Sermon on the Mount? He said that we're to love our enemies. He knew that these were his enemies. And how did he respond to them on the cross? The same way in which he instructed them on the Sermon of the Mount. To, to respond in love even when we are mistreated. And he certainly modeled that when he was on the cross of Calvary. Even though they were crucifying him. Even though they hated him. And they wanted to take his life. They didn't take his life. He gave his life. We'll talk more about that in a little bit. He gave his life, but they were being, uh, they were rebelling against him. They were uh, wanting him to die. They were serving him in injustice, yet he still loved them. Wow. And he still loves you, Dad. So you're saying if somebody mistreats us, then we're supposed to thank God for, uh, forgive them, God, for they know not what they're doing. They might know what they're doing. I know some do. It's like my daughter was on my crap about paying tithes. She said, Dad, you don't have to buy blessings. I said, what did you just say? I said, that's being obedient to the Lord. And, and uh, well, I didn't know what else to say. But uh, it's following the Bible. You know, you should pay your tithes. You know? you know what I mean? And she said that she was raised in church. You know, she was a new fellowship. She actually said that to me last week. Because I was on her about her husband, she paid tithe. You know. And uh, she commented back to me and said, Dad, you don't have to buy your blessing from God. Uh, what do you say to someone like that? I was ready to kick her in the butt, but she's too far away. <laughs> well, I, you, I, know, I, you know, I, I, let me tell you something. They make a lot of money. And for them to pay 10% of what they make, probably be around 20000 a year. And I, I still think it doesn't matter what you make. The top of it's good price. Ten percent of it's good price. I'll agree with you hundred percent. I mean, and I mean, it took me a while to start doing that, but I, I mean, for I, years I, I knew about it, you know. But I just started doing it. For so long. I mean, the last month I ran into a little jam running down to my daughter's, but with finance, with money, but I mean, I'm getting back on track. The thing of it is, is no matter how someone treats us, they don't control our response. It's our response should be controlled by the Spirit of God. He said, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. Sometimes people can even be feeling like they're, they are rightful in being vindictive or being wrong. But as right as they might feel like they are, it's not our responsibility to fix their mind and their thoughts and what they're doing. It's our responsibility to love people regardless and to forgive. That's in the model of prayer that's given to us. Do you, do you, forgive us as we forgive those who trespass against us. What's that? Do you think when you give your tithe uh, a, a large sum, do you think you should pray and ask the Lord to... to You bless that in hundredfold and twentyfold and thousandfold, or do you believe that's that's asking God for money, right? And people do do that. You know, I'll say this. You know what? If 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 we have anything, we're blessed already. What do you mean? What are you saying? If I'm able to pay my tithe, I'm blessed already that God has given me job and revenue that I can Right, he's not going to be, it's just when you pay your tithe, you can't expect it. When you pay your tithe, you can't expect God to give you money. I mean, and that's kind of cool. You know, there, but you, I, I don't want to get completely off track because there's several things. But let me answer your question quickly and say this. You know, there's a, there's a philosophy that if you sow, you're going to reap more than one. And, and I believe there's a philosophy of sowing and reaping. But our reaping may not be in our bank account or in our paycheck. Our reaping may be in our health, our reaping may Correct. be in benefits that are far beyond that. And we healing, don't know, of, and we, healing of a disease or something like that. Absolutely. That's uh, and you know what? Even if God doesn't 
it's still our requirement to be obedient right. to God regardless. Okay. And the long-term effect of that obedience to God is greater than anything because God will bless us for our obedience. If not in, in, in this earth, He will certainly bless us in eternity. And, 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 I, and I, I feel that there are people being led astray by that doctrine because it's, 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 it's a very non-biblical doctrine that, you know, folks have all kinds. I've sat in churches. I've been invited to church. My wife and I went to visit a, a wonderful friend of ours who invited us to church. And they fly around on a plane and they believe it is because they sold into the ministry and now they're reaping. You know, I, I, don't, I, don't, I don't agree with that doctrine. I don't find it's biblically biblical based. I, be, I believe that it's obedience. Let's move on to the next thing. He said, Verily I say unto thee, This day thou shalt be with me in paradise. So I'm going to read Luke 23, 43. And Jesus said unto him, Verily I say unto you, That today shalt thou be with me in paradise. So here is one of the two malefactors who's being crucified on either side of Jesus. He wasn't the only one being crucified that day. But there was one that looked out to him in faith and trust. And, and, uh, uh, and, and, and we find that as, as he said, let me just, uh, he said to him, he said, Lord, remember me when you are coming to your kingdom. He's shown that he is putting faith in Jesus Christ and who he is. And because of that, Jesus answers and says, this day, you're going to be with me in paradise. Now, let me ask you this question before we go any further. How, how long was that man in paradise? Three days. You got it. Because things changed. Because after the atoning work of Jesus Christ on the cross of Calvary, we find that, that who, who else would, would have been in paradise? All of the Old Testament saints. That's, you know, that, that, that brings it all together. All the Old Testament saints. Yes, you're right, brother. Uh, all the Old Testament saints would have been in paradise. Some of them in there, when we're looking at them in our world of time, for a very long time. But this man's only going to be there three days because Jesus Christ, we find that when he is resurrected from the grave, paradise now, they go from paradise to heaven. Now we're in the New Testament and under the dispensation of grace because the blood of Jesus Christ, which avails, which avails. The blood of, of, of all the other sacrifices were only a covering. It could not do what the atoning work of Jesus Christ upon the cross of Calvary did for us in this dispensation of Christ. Uh, if we die in the faith, for us to be absent from the body, we are present with God. And so because of faith, uh, uh, the only thing that, 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 that keeps us from heaven is sin. And, and this man confessed his, his, himself to Jesus Christ, his faith in Jesus Christ. And, and so uh, because of that, he was able to uh, secure his eternity, three days in paradise and eternity in heaven. How about that? Pretty neat for that man, isn't it? He might be crucified too. And, and, and think about his death and, and, and how it was. And he, he was probably guilty because why he was there. Uh, but he found that in the middle of death, he found life. Mm -hmm. Hallelujah. He found life. And uh, when he died, he went to paradise. But he was only there for three days. Amen. Because of the work of Jesus Christ. Now he is in heaven. Are you saying when we die, we go to paradise? Then? No. Where's paradise? That's what I, I Paradise is done away with. All right. There's no need for paradise anymore. Since Jesus is. Amen. Not back in the Old Testament. That's right. The where, Old where, Testament. Where, where, where do you call paradise? What's that? What do you call paradise? Paradise was a place that men who died in the faith or women or anyone who died in the faith went prior, prior to the resurrection of Jesus Christ. So when we die, we go to heaven. If you're a born-again believer, 
if you have the blood of Jesus Christ applied to your life. In the Old Testament, because the work of the cross had not been yet, when they died in the faith, they went to a place called paradise. I'm talking about a holy hotel. You know, I think I think we can term it that. Yeah. A good holding cell. The very best of holding cells. Well, I'm trying to relate to what you're saying because I never heard of paradise. And when you brought it up, I just, I got to look at Old Testament. That's exactly right. And you, you said it exactly right. That's where Abraham was when he saw it. The rich man? Yeah. That's exactly right. Where Muslim, Muslim, so that's right. He he was in Abraham's bosom. Yeah. So we see the rich man and and um, Lazarus. Lazarus. I'm not just my lunch. Terrible thing getting old. <laughs> Who was poor? He was carried away to Abraham's bosom or paradise. In hell, the rich man lifted up his eyes. And he saw that poor beggar in paradise. He realized the ills of his ways. He said, could, could someone go, could I go back and tell my, 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 my brother? The whole scenario there. No, they have the prophets. That is all paradise. We can talk more about it later. I'm going to continue to, to move. I don't want to give you, I don't want to not answer your question. Does that give you some answers? I don't know how to study the Bible monetary now. All right, you check it out. You got me. Uh, now, I'm telling you the truth, brother. I'm telling you the got truth. got me thinking in the right direction. All right, good, good. That's good. So, this day thou shalt be with me in paradise. Next is John chapter number 19, verse 26 and 27. John 19, 26 and 27. Jesus dying on the cross. And I may not have all the details, but I'll give you the picture of what she said. And she said, and Jesus got boo-boos on his arms and his legs. And Jesus died. Mommy, Jesus died. And so my wife's like, so I'm going to explain this to her at a three-year-old level. And so she said to her, my wife said to her, she said, yes, he did. But he came back. And that's why we celebrate Easter, because Jesus came back. And all of a sudden, this little girl's eyes got big, and she looked, and she said, he came back because he missed his mommy. <laughs> <laughs> well, when I thought about this, he did love his mother, didn't he? And he came back for his mother. Hey, I'm sure that, you know, there, there was a certain type of endearment for her. Um, uh, why wouldn't there be? Uh, uh, but, but we find that Jesus, when he was on the cross, of those five individuals that were around about the cross, he focuses on two of them. And he looks at his mother. And he says to her, woman, now, he was not using a disrespectful title. This was not disrespectful in their culture and how they referred. But it was very much a term of endearment. It was a term of respect. He said, woman, behold your son. 
You see, because Mary understood it, she knew something that no one else did. Joseph, probably at this point, was deceased, wasn't on the picture. And so Jesus did have half-brothers and sisters reminding us that his father was God the Father, and he was conceived of the Holy Ghost and his, uh, his earthly mother, Mary. And so he had half-siblings and he had half-brothers, but understand, they did not have the same experience Mary had by the angel speaking to her. They did not understand all the things that Mary experienced, and she pondered them, and she kept them very dear and sacred in her heart. They didn't understand. But John understood a spiritual truth that his brother did not understand. So he assigned John. He said, John, I want you to take care of my mom. Uh, uh, John was so humble by this. He doesn't refer to himself by name in his gospel. He always refers to him as the other disciple or the disciple whom Jesus loved. Uh, and, and so he takes that and, and he brings this connection. He loved his mother and he was concerned for her. He knew that he would be back in three days, but she may not understand everything. And she's going to go through a grieving process. I talk to people over and over, and I talk to my own mom, and they'll tell me regularly, parents are not supposed to bury their children. Children are supposed to bury their parents. That's the way we think of it in our culture and in our mind and in the natural sense. And she's going to be grieving. Uh, she loved him. She knew who he was. She knew the greatness of him. She just saw him mistreated, and now he's dying an unjust death. But Jesus is concerned, even about his mother. How amazing. God help us in our culture. He was concerned about the physical things of his brother. Her care. Her well-being. Her emotions as she goes through this difficult time. BYO, the athletes, they all speak about their mother. You never hardly ever see them speak about their father. I'm serious. In basketball, like Duke and, uh, Duke and Kansas played every Sunday, and we've seen some of them athletes, and all of these spoke about, about after my mother. My mother raised me as a single, and they had it hard, and you know what I mean? You it, know what I mean? It, 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 it's hard to believe. I think, unfortunately, in our culture, we have a lot of uh, non-interactive dads, unfortunately. So that may be a little bit of culture, but I think there is something that God just gives to a mother. You know, I look at even my rearing, I look at our children's rearing. You know, mom is there a little more than dad. Not that I'm not there. I try to be engaged as much as I can, but, you know, I'm not there. There are certain things that mom can do that dad just can't do. Um, so that could be some of it. But I do believe, Brother Craig, I love what you said about your dad model. That's who you are to be. I believe dad should play a very big role in both sons and daughters' lives. And I think that that's what creates healthy families when both of them do. But we find that, that once again, it's only going to be for three days that Mary's going to be in this place. But three days can be pretty long. You ever lose a close loved one? Those three days are pretty long, huh? You don't sleep. You don't sleep. Your mind thinks about it. You're praying. You're missing them. Our emotional, our physical part misses that. Uh, time helps us adapt. But the good thing on Mary's side is three days later, the resurrection will help her adapt. Yeah. Amen. And we'll give evidence to who her son is. Do you believe we got the power in us? Yeah, that's a long time. They were coping. They were, that's right. What's that, brother? We got the same power in us that ready to resurrect Jesus Christ. I sure do. Well, why can't we resurrect somebody? I believe our faith. Our faith ain't strong enough. And I think sometimes in our life and the way that we live, I think it comes by prayer, by fasting, by allowing the Holy Ghost to empower us. 
us. If that same spirit which raised Christ up from the dead, go quicken our mortal bodies. We are commanded to do these things and even greater things than what Christ has done. Are you serious? Absolutely. I was debating if I wanted to get involved, but the reason, I just wanted to throw this into, I don't know if it would simplify it at all, but the reason that we have the same power in us that raised Jesus from the dead is because it, the, it's the Holy Ghost that raised Jesus from the dead, and He's the one that goes with us, and when you're filled with the baptism of the Holy Ghost, He's the one that dwells in you, and that's why that power is in you, because that power is the Holy Ghost, and the Holy Ghost is the one that raised Jesus from the dead. Definitely is the Spirit of God. The, the Word of God says that that same Spirit which raised Christ up from the dead, the Holy Spirit, the Holy Ghost, the Spirit of God. And if He dwells in us, He'll raise us up. So, First of all, He'll bring us to life physically, spiritually, when we're dead. We'll talk more about it. Let's move on. Someone read Matthew 27, verse number 46. And about the ninth hour, Jesus cried with a loud voice, saying, Eli, Eli, lama sabachthani, that is to say, My God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? He said, My God. My God, why hast thou forsaken me? For they know a couple of things. He said with a loud voice, he's not weak. He's not dying of, of weakness. His loud voice shows that he is still strong. Why hast thou forsaken me? You see, there's one thing that is always separated Someone from God. And what is that one thing? Sin. And for God the Father to see His Son take on Him the sins of all the world. That means every liar, every murderer, every molester, every conniving, just scoundrel you can think about. Every sin. Uh, some of them are so grotesque, we wouldn't even allow our minds to go there. But because of all those sins... Jesus Christ died. And to imagine that sin separated and can, sin can still continues to separate mankind from God. But Jesus cried out uh, there in, in the Aramaic, Eli, Eli, lama sabachthani. Uh, 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 why hast thou forsaken me? You see, it's showing us a couple of things. God didn't deliver him from that, but Jesus bore the weight and the guilt and the punishment for all our sins. What a Savior. And oh, what a Savior. Oh, hallelujah, the songwriter. Oh, a Savior that would take upon him all the sins of the world. He bore that for you and for I. In John chapter 19, verse number 28. So I want to read that. John 19, verse number 28. might be fulfilled. He said, I thirst. In Psalms 69, verse number 21, the Bible says, they gave me also gall for my meat, 
and my thirst they gave me vinegar to drink. See, it wasn't only, it was a physical, it was a spiritual thirst, but it was also a fulfillment of Scripture. So everything about the crucifixion of Christ was a fulfillment of Scripture. Everything about His life was a fulfillment. Someone read John 19, verse number 30. When Jesus therefore had received the vinegar, He said, It is finished. And he bowed his head and gave, uh, gave up the ghost. Amen. Here is the greatest words at the greatest price that gave the greatest grace when he said, it is finished. I know you've heard me say this before, but I want to remind you once again. He did not say, I am finished. He was not finished. He didn't, he didn't say, I'm finished. The, 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 the crucifixion on the cross has got to me. The thirst has got to me. Everything has got to me. I, I, I'm finished. He didn't say, I'm finished. But he said this. And the word of God, once again, uh, as, as he cries out in and, and that loud voice, it is finished. He paid the greatest price for us, and he did what the Father commanded him to do. I think it's interesting. All our pictures fell down, sister, not you made, except for that one over there in the Garden of Gethsemane. And so when I was in here this evening, I was thinking about that. God ain't speaking to us through that. I believe that those are the greatest moments. He had already in that Garden of Gethsemane wrestled in prayer, and there he sweat great drops of blood, the Bible says, as he said, not my will, but thine be done. I don't want to do this. I don't want to go to the cross. I don't want to drink this bitter cup, the cup of all sin and filth. I don't want, I don't, I don't want to take that into me. He said, but not my will, but yours be done. For God so loved the world that He gave His only begotten Son. Why did He give? Because He came with a mission in mind. We love the Christmas story. We love the nativity. We love the angels. We love the shepherds. We love everything about it. But what we often forget is that little baby came with a purpose in mind. He was born to die. Amen. Wow. We are born and we die. But He was born with a purpose to die. And he came to do the Father's will. What did he say even in the temple? I'm about my Father's business. He was about doing the will of God all his life. And he finally, on the cross, 33 and a half years, put a crown. He said, It's finished. God, it's finished. I've completed the task. I've struggled in my flesh as a man, yet I was without sin. The devil tempted me into the wilderness when I was fasting and I overcame. I was faithful in everything you called me to do, and I've been faithful to the cross. It is finished. The work is done. I love me. He completed it. He didn't procrastinate. He didn't do it half-heartedly. He did it as unto the Father. He did it. Yes. So Christ was tempted just like we are. Yet without sin, the Lord God says. Right. You're talking about everything that we're tempted with. I You're talking everything. about lust, uh, all kinds of evil stuff, and all that you're saying. Absolutely. And he defeated it. Yet without sin. That's, that's, our, that's awesome. Because he was God. And so a human being can never do that even if they want it. We have the Spirit of God. We can do it. We can do it. We can do it. We can overcome. We can be victorious. We can live a sinless life. Except what none try to be. Well, I don't know what they try to be, but you can't do it without the Spirit of God. Well, salvation, absolutely. Salvation, where the old man is eradicated and all things have become new. We're no longer walking in darkness, but we're walking in light. 
and how he fills with the Spirit. Amen. The Spirit. Amen. That's exactly right, brother. Let me finish up the last thing. I, my, my goal was to be done at 9.45. I'm behind. The last, Luke 23, 46. Someone you want to share anything? Any thoughts? 